You should have a handout, Why I Believe in the Miracle of Divine Creation. So this title is a little off <laughs> because most people would not consider Hugh Ross a creationist, even though he believes in creation. Usually when we think of a creationist, we think of somebody who believes in a literal uh, six days of creation, a uh, 24-hour period. He, Hugh Ross is an old earther, and so you might wonder, why in the world are we taking our time to talk about Hugh Ross? If uh, we, t we, you know, most of us, I think, are, hold to the young earth position, but I know that some of you do hold to an old earth. And again, I, I say my position is probably a hybrid of the two. And again, I think K.P. Colson's book, uh, Creation Unfolding, describes well the position I currently hold to. Um, and I say currently just because I think this is such a big issue. I don't know that it's ever going to be resolved on this side. Uh, we're all going to find out exactly how God did it one day. But we don't know at this point. We're, we're trying to make the best educated guesses we can. Uh, but, but one thing I, I do want to share about Hugh Ross, because Hugh Ross is, he is the most influential Christian in science in the world today. So I think it's important that we, that we look at him a little bit. And I thought in our last, this might be a surprise to you, I'm, I'm finishing the series. <laughs> and it's because it's just, it's too demanding reading wise, and I have too many other things I need to read and focus on. So I'm just calling it, I'm pulling the plug on No Final <laughs> Conflict. Um, you know, again, there's much more to be said on biology and physics and all kind of stuff. But I did, I have provided, and if you don't have it, I do have a extensive, I think it's a, 17-page bibliography that has many resources on all the topics that we've covered and more. And so if you want that, just email me and I can send you the PDF of that and you can do your own research. And one of the nice things about that too is it's got a lot of um, YouTube channels and websites that you can go to for more information that's free. And if you don't feel like reading, you can watch stuff instead. Um, but again, this is just a huge topic, but I've decided to go to a more broad topic starting next week. We're gonna do a series, and again, that's probably gonna last a while as well, on apologetics. And so I'm, I'm just entitling it, Know Why You Believe, from the famous book, uh, stealing the title from the famous book by Paul Little. I know Rick Lopez was impacted by that book quite a bit. Um, but Know Why You Believe is, is a basic text of apologetics that answers some of the main questions that people ask, um, or uh, not even necessarily, um, I, I think the Know Why You Believe questions, what's interesting about that, he wrote that in the 70s, and the same questions are still being asked today. And he was a campus minister for InterVarsity before it went woke, <laughs> you know. Unfortunately, InterVarsity has gone a bad direction, I think. Uh, but before they went that direction, uh, there was a lot of good people working, and there still are good people working for them as well. Uh, but unfortunately, like a lot of campus ministries, they've gone, uh, they're, they're more influenced by the culture than they are by the Word of God, and that's a tragedy. Uh, but it tends to happen all over the place. But anyway, um, so we're, so we're going to tackle Know Why You Believe, and that means we're going to get into all kinds of questions related to, you know, the problem of evil, you know, why is there suffering, um, you know, how do we know there's a God, how do we know the Bible is the Word of God, and so forth. We're going to answer a lot of the questions related to apologetics. And I'm probably going to do that series for a while, probably even longer than this series, because it it's broader. It's not just science. It covers all the big questions. And so we're going to get into postmodernism and relativism and how that influences decision making today and all kinds of topics. So anyway, we'll start that next week. And so next week's sort of just going to be an introduction to, to that. And then we'll, we'll go from there. So new series starting next week. This is the last number 24 in No Final Conflict. And uh, hopefully you know a little bit more. Uh, hopefully you're not more confused than when we started. <laughs> but uh, it's okay. So, so this is from a book um, that you can get. I think it's still in print. It's called uh, Why I'm a Christian, Leading Thinkers Explain Why They Believe. And it was put out by Baker Books. Uh, in 2001, 
And so one of the articles in that book is by Hugh Ross, and he says why, I'm, why I believe in the miracle of divine creation. And so I thought I'd read this to you. One of the unfortunate things is two of the tables that he references in here, it was impossible for me to format them. I tried for like an hour, and it was just impossible, so I just finally just gave up. Um, but if you want those, um, I could probably send you something that, uh, if you go to his website, you could find those tables, I think. Um, so if you really want that, either get this book or get any of his books. He's written about 15 books. Two of the books are on this specific topic about the probability of life on Earth. And what he does is he gives scientific evidence why it's so improbable that uh, we, we could even have life and have a life-sustaining planet like we do without a divine creator. So, um, so again, I apologize in advance. I tried to format the table, and again, it was just impossible for me to do it. So what I'm going to do is I'm just going to I'm going to read through this. We may or may not get through it just time-wise, but I'll do my best to try to get through this. And uh, again, there's extra copies because. We had double copies made today. That's, it's a long story, but don't worry about it. But if you want extra copies, please take them and give them to people. Um, so anyway, take extra copies if you'd like, but there's plenty of copies for everyone today. <laughs> All right, let me, let me start. So this is Hugh Ross talking. And again, this is from a book. And this book, uh, what's interesting about this book is it takes people from different uh, areas of science, philosophy, um, theology, different, different uh, subjects, and these are well-known Christians who write, and they talk about why through their subject they became Christians. So in that book, the common denominator is all these people who write in this book studied their subject, and in Hugh Ross's case it was astronomy, and through the study of their subject they became Christians. So it's an interesting book uh, to read. All right, so this is from his chapter. So he says for me, <coughs> again, this is Hugh Ross talking, the evidence for creation was the starting point of my coming to faith in Christ. By the way, he's in, he was in Canada. He grew up in Vancouver, Canada, so he is a Canadian. My strong interest in astronomy began when I was seven years, and from the age of eight, I knew my future career would lie in that field. During my teenage years, I pursued a vigorous program of variable star observations. In the midst of that program, I began a serious study of cosmology. Even then, in the early 1960s, it seemed obvious to me that the observations uniquely supported the theory of general relativity and the Big Bang explanation for the universe. So he, he does hold to a Big Bang uh, cosmo cosmogony. Um, if there is a cosmic beginning, there must exist a cosmic creator. Thus, from the age of 16 onward, I never doubted God's existence. Though God's existence and the reality of a transcendent, a transcendent creation event ceased to be a matter of doubt, I was highly skeptical that the God who created 100 billion trillion stars would want to communicate through a book to humans on an insignificant speck we call Earth. Nevertheless, for the sake of academic honesty, I launched into a critical study of the holy books of the world's great religions. Except for the Bible, my suspicions were confirmed that they were penned from the limited space-time perspective of human beings and reflected the limited and often incorrect scientific knowledge of the times in which they were written. Only the Bible leaped beyond the dimensions of length, width, height, and time. Only the Bible successfully predicted future scientific discoveries. Only the Bible accurately described cosmic origins and the anthro anthropically fine-tuned nature of the universe and solar system. These discoveries, the obviously superior moral message of the Bible, and its uniquely complete solution to the human moral dilemma, led me at the age of 19 to sign my name in the back of a Gideon Bible. By the way, somebody gave him a Gideon Bible. <laughs> and, and by reading that Bible, that's how he became a Christian. Indicating my commitment to make Jesus Christ my Lord and Savior. Eight years later, 
I finally met other Christians with whom I could discuss spiritual matters. I found that the lack of strong evidence for creation was what kept most Christians from discussing with their friends and associates the truth claims of Jesus Christ and the Bible. At that point, I began to spend significant time researching the evidence for the accuracy of the biblical creation doctrine and developing tools to brief, uh, to assist both scholars and lay people in communicating the evidence. What follows is a brief summary of the latest scientific evidence that the God of the Bible transcendently created the universe for the benefit of the human race. Readers will find much more complete discussions of my other writings and videos. Also, I'm omitting here evidence that God created the first life forms, all the life forms seen in the fossil record and human species. Such evidence, too, I discuss elsewhere. And the footnotes are in the back, so if you want to, or actually they're not in here. They're not included in here. Uh, but again, if you really want those, you can email me and I can get those to you. Okay, anatomy's unique perspective. Uh, astronomy, not anatomy. <laughs> anatomy has a unique perspective as well, but we're talking about astronomy. Okay, unlike other science disciplines, astronomy directly observes and measures the past. Because light travels at a fixed finite velocity, the constancy of light's velocity throughout all cosmic history and geography is easily proven. We see and measure conditions on an astronomical object as they were when the object's radiation began moving towards us. That the radiation came from the object rather than from the distance between us and the object is also well established. When we look at the sun, for example, we see its conditions eight minutes ago when the visible light and other radiation we now detect left the sun. When we map the Orion Nebula, we see it as it was 1,200 years ago. When we examine the center of our galaxy, we discover what was happening there 30,000 years ago. When we study the core of the Andromeda galaxy, we observe what took place 2 million years ago, given light's travel time. So again, I want to stop for a second there because again, um, he holds to an old Earth position. Uh, he believes that the Earth is 14.7 billion, or the, not the Earth, the universe is 14.7. I disagree with that view. Okay, so I'm just, I want to clarify, I don't believe this myself. He does. And, um, but again, his study of science and a young Earth study of science, like there are young Earth people that have also become Christians that are a study of, like Henry Morris. Um, what's interesting is, is they have different views on the age, but they have the same view on the gospel. Okay, so I, again, I just want to remind you that for me, this is an intramural debate among Christians. Um, that's my view. You, you might hold a harder or softer view on that. I, I don't know. But again, I think this is something that my perspective on this in reaching lost people is I've used Hugh Ross's books. I've given Hugh Ross's books away to people that have become Christians, okay? So uh, even though I disagree with his view on this particular issue, I think he's dead on with the essentials that if he lived here, he would be a member of our church. Uh, well, if he wants to. <laughs> okay, but he doesn't, he, he doesn't not hold to the, any of the essentials that we hold to in our doctrinal statement. But he does have a different view than I do, and maybe you do, on the age of the earth. So I just, I, I just want to tell you that we have the same information, but it's how you interpret the information. And there are Christians that differ in their interpretation of the information. And that goes for many issues. I just finished a book on divorce and remarriage yesterday. And three Christians, and, and what's interesting is the guy who holds the mediating position used to hold the position of one of the other guys who defends a position that he wrote a book with, and he changed his view. And so in this book, he used to hold to one of the other guys' views. Now he holds to a totally different view. One of the guys in the book says, I admire the fact that he publicly wrote about this and has changed his, he had the humility to change his position and now defend that position against the guy that he co-wrote a book with of another position. And that happens. You know, uh, again, that, that should happen to you too. It, it should happen where you study the Bible enough that sometimes you go, you know what, what I grew up with 
or what so-and-so taught me. I've studied the Bible for myself, and I think they're wrong. And that's okay. Okay? Uh, that means that you're serious about studying the Bible and not just believing whatever somebody tells you. That means you're critically thinking. And so we want to create people in our church that think critically. Not, not, I don't mean critically in the sense of you're a critic of everything and, and you're just, you have the gift of criticism. That's not a gift, by the way. That is not a spiritual gift. Okay? I've had people come to me and say, God told me to tell you this. And then they critique me on something that honestly is a preference. It's not necessarily a biblical thing. And, uh, and they're an emissary of, they think they're an emissary of God, and I think they might be an emissary of somebody else. But anyway, that's another issue. Uh, but, but again, I just want to tell you that in this class, it's important that you feel comfortable to be able to agree to disagree, to dialogue, to be able to have a different view. And that's okay. That's why we're here. We're here to try to get at the truth. And some issues are complex. And this is one of them. So again, my view very simply is I believe that God created uh, everything through supernatural, supernaturally. And he did it at hyper speed. So that things that Hugh Ross is saying are old, uh, yes, appear to be older than I think they really are. Because God, I believe, created things mature. He, he created things so that, like mankind out of the dust, but he created them as adults, not as babies. He created them mature so they could reproduce and so that they could eat. If they were babies, they would have just died. Okay, so, so I think it's just logical, it's common sense to read the Bible at the beginning and go, okay, there are things here that appear to have, uh, they're mature. So if we're to evaluate them scientifically, according to K.P. Colson, we would be wrong because they didn't naturally come about. They came about through supernatural processes that God did quickly. So my view is the age makes sense if you're just looking at it naturally. But as believers, we're not just looking at it naturally. We're looking at it supernaturally. And so you have to factor that in. And I think when you factor that in, I think both the old age and the young earth actually make sense when you take into consideration the supernatural uh, way in which God made things. Okay, so that's my view. All right, so continuing on. Uh, in a sense, astronomers can claim to witness the past. To see how the creation was taking shape a certain number of years ago, we need only focus our instruments on objects the appropriate distance away. With recent technological advances, we can actually see all the way back to when light first separated from darkness and even to a split second after the cosmic explosion with which all the universe's time, space, matter, and ener energy began. Early evidence for a transcendent cause. The first clue that a causative agent operating from beyond matter, energy, and the space-time dimensions of the universe must be responsible for the existence of the universe came via Einstein's theory of general relativity. The picture that emerges from the equations defining the theory is that a finite time ago, the entire cosmos bursts forth and is still expanding from an infinitely or nearly infinitely dense state. Actually, this same picture can be derived from Newtonian mechanics. On the condition there exists a star and a planet of the type needed for physical life, stable orbits of planets about stars <coughs> will be possible only in a universe described by three very large, rapidly expanding dimensions of space. Whether or not the universe is expanding in the manner predicted by general relativity and Newtonian mechanics can be tested through measuring relative to us the velocities of galaxies at various distances. The first such sy systematic measures completed in 1929 verified that the universe indeed was expanding from a beginning. This conclusion was supported by confirmations of all three predictions Einstein deduced from his theory, namely the bending of light, the shifting of certain spectral lines, and the orbital behavior of inner solar system planets. Okay, aren't you glad that you're not an astronomer <laughs> to figure this out, figure out this kind of stuff? 
space-time theorem of general relativity. By the way, I, I, I used to pastor a church um, 20 minutes, well, 20, 25 minutes from, um, Palomar from the Palomar Observatory. So we were at the base of Palomar Mountain. And, uh, and so used to go up there quite a bit. We had somebody who lived just actually across the street from the observatory. And he had a bunch of land up there, cattle. He was sort of like our John Wayne. He, 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 was, he was a rancher and, and raised cattle up there. And, but anyway, he lived right across the street from the observatory. And his children went to, actually went to school there. There's a school right by there. And so all the, all the students essentially were kids of the scientists that worked at Palomar, Palomar Observatory. So occasionally we'd get a, science, a scientist that was also a Christian that worked there and went to our church. So I got to um, do a lot of stuff behind the scenes and check stuff out. But the interesting thing is you, you, most of what you see as a layperson, you have no idea what you're seeing. And what they're doing is almost all math. And, it, and like as somebody who grew up hating math, okay, like to me, uh, to be an astronomer would be the absolute worst job. Like to me, that's about as close to hell as you could get, I think, uh, for me personally. But what, what stood out to me is just really how incredibly brilliant these people are. I mean, uh, you have to know very high math to be an astronomer. And just very interesting, though, how they come up with distances and, you know, all these equations they use. And so in the astronomy room, they have all these boards that they write on and they left certain, like Fred Hoyle still has stuff up there they haven't erased because um, he's considered one of the most famous astronomers ever. And, um, and anyway, it's just pretty interesting, though, all the stuff that has gone on on Palomar Mountain, all the discoveries and everything. But most of what they do is they're looking through this, but they have to figure out things mathematically. And it's, it's just pretty interesting. If you ever get a chance to go to an observatory like that, uh, it's really a fascinating thing to check out. Did you, so, get, to see the, did you get to see things through the telescope? No. You're not allowed to. Yeah, you have to be a, you you have to be on staff. You, but they could show us and tell us about it, and they do have certain times of the year where um, I think you have to donate quite a bit of money, which I don't have. Uh, but some people that donate a lot of money can can see though that's you know it's it's very much supervised and um, yeah it's limited. Yeah, but no, I never, I never did get to see that. I got to see a lot of pictures of stuff that they've taken, which is also pretty interesting. All right. Um, Space-time theorem of general relativity. And again, a lot of this might go over your head. Don't worry about it. Um, uh, he's going to get to some specifics that I think are interesting in a, in a sec. But in, in, in a 1970 research paper, Stephen Hawking and Roger Penrose proved a new theorem. If the equations of general relativity reliably describe the dynamics of the universe, and if the universe contains any measurable mass, then space and time must have originated concurrently with matter and energy. Also, the cause of the universe must bring it into existence independent or transcendent of matter, energy, and all the space-time dimensions that can be associated with matter and energy. A corollary to this theorem is that time itself is finite. It had a beginning outside the universe's boundaries. Obviously, the universe contains mass. However, in 1970, a tiny shadow of doubt still hovered over the extent of general relativity's reliability, leaving room for at least a little speculation. Ten years later, however, a NASA racket, uh, rocket, <laughs> NASA racket, uh, that NASA is, that's a racket, you know, uh, that NASA rocket experiment all but erased that shadow demonstrating that the reliability of general relativity exceeded 99.99%. In 1994, a team led by radio astronomer Joseph Taylor used 21 years of measurements on the orbital periods of binary pulsar. PSR, 1913 plus 16, two neutron stars orbiting one another, to confirm general relativity's reliability to better than 99 point, all those nines percent. 
In Roger Penrose's words, this research data made Einstein's general relativity the most accurate tested theory known to science. General relativity is also the most exhaustively tested principle in physics. In addition to the three tests proposed by Einstein, modern day physicists and astronomers have developed nine more. Number one, retardation of radar and laser signals bounced off various solar system bodies. Two, dragging and twisting of the space-time fabric by rapidly rotating neutron stars and black holes. Three, oscillation rates of X-ray radiation from disks of gas and dust orbiting black holes. Four, population statistics of black holes at different masses. Five, infall velocities of accretion disks surrounding supermassive, exceeding a million solar masses of black holes. Okay, I'm not even going to read the rest of these because <laughs> this, I don't know about you, this means nothing to me. Um, until recently, the last eight of these tests lay beyond the measuring limits of our best instruments. Since 1998, however, all nine tests have been successfully performed, and all nine demonstrate the applicability and reliability of general relativity. Now that the reliability of general relativity has been established beyond any reasonable doubt, all uncertainty in the space-time theorem of general relativity has been removed. This establishes a singular origin of matter, energy, space, and time, and that the act or cause of the universe arises from some context, dimensions, realm, or other, independent of the space-time dimensions of our universe. Of all the holy books of the religions of the world, only the Bible's claims about cosmic creation are consistent with general relativity's space-time theorem. Now that's really important. Um, so again, you don't have to get all the specifics of this, but again, what, what, what arguably the most confirmed theorem in scientific history confirms is that uh, matter, time, energy, uh, had a starting point. And so the, the reality here is that matter is not eternal. Time is not eternal. That, that used to be the standard view, the steady state theory. And that has just been annihilated by the study of science itself. So now you're left with how, did, how, how is there anything at all? And where did it come from? And I, th I think the, this, uh, this helps us more as Christians because the very first verse in the Bible says, in the beginning, God. So, so again, you either have something coming from nothing, which if you think about that for one second or two seconds or three, however long it takes to think about that, um, I think what the Bible teaches is very consistent with reality, more so than any other theory. Okay? So, so that's why this is really important, is that even though we may disagree with some of Hugh Ross's views, as a, as a scientist, especially as an astronomer, studying from, again, he didn't go to a Christian school. I think he got his degree from the University of, of Toronto. He wrote his PhD at University of Toronto. But here's a guy who, not just him, but there are literally thousands of scientists. Uh, there's over 2,000 uh, published scientists that have signed a document descending from evolution and from evolutionary theory, and he's one of them. So even though he might hold to a different view than I do, I, I respect the fact that here's a guy who through his study, his honest study of science, he's trying to show people that in his study of astronomy, all his books do this, they point you back to God. So even though it might, I might disagree with him in certain areas, I respect the fact that he's using his expertise in, in astronomy to be able to say, hey, uh, God made us to have a relationship with him and, and he talks about science, but then he gets you to Jesus, ultimately. And I think that's a good model for any of us, you know. Take what we know and get people to Jesus, okay? All right.
Extra dimension creation, extra dimensional creation. The creator's transcendence uh, received dramatic verification and extension in 1996 as physicists and astronomers tackled two seemingly intractable problems plaguing the Big Bang models. The first dilemma was this. Treating fundamental particles as point entities, which is the traditional view, made unification of any of the four forces of physics impossible. Since we have both complete theoretical and complete experimental proof that this unification can and did occur for the weak nuclear force and the electromagnetic force, some new approach or explanation is necessary, one allowing more flexibility. That new something proved to be lines or loops of energy called strings. When theoreticians treated fundamental particles as highly stretched, vibrating, rotating, elastic bands in the extreme heat of the first split second of creation, the dilemma disappeared. For all practical purposes, they behave as points under the cooler conditions since then, but not in the crucial beginning moment. Strings, however, require more than three spatial dimensions. They need more room to operate. They need at least a few dimensions beyond the ones we experience. The second dilemma was that in the easily recognized four space-time dimensions of the universe, all gravitational theories imply that quantum mechanics is impossible, and all quantum mechanical theories imply that gravity is impossible. Andrew Strominger hypothesized a brilliant resolution in the form of extremal, that is very small, black holes, which became massless at critical moments. At first, however, he seemed merely to have traded one dilemma for another. Black holes are massive objects so highly collapsed that their gravity attracts anything within proximity. How can a black hole be massless without violating the definition of a black hole or without violating the principles of gravity? Simply put, how can there be gravity without mass? The answer lay, once again, in extra dimensionality. Strominger discovered that in six spatial dimensions, the mass of an extremal, extremal black hole is proportional to its surface area. As the surface shrinks, the mass eventually becomes zero. The resolution works given the existence of exactly six extra spatial dimensions. He's going to get to the point in a, a second, so hang in there. One theory solves the two great dilemmas. Here's what the theory tells us. The universe was created with ten rapidly expanding space-time dimensions. When the universe was just 10 to the 43 seconds old, the moment when gravity separated from the strong electroweak force, six of these 10 dimensions ceased to expand. Today, these six dimensions still remain as a component of the universe, but they are as tightly curled up as when the cosmos was only 10 to the 43 seconds old. Their cross sections are 10 to 33 centimeters, so small as to be undetectable by direct measurement. Six sets of evidences indicate that this theory is correct. Perhaps the most convincing is that string theory produces as a bonus byproduct all the equations of special and ge general relativity. In other words, if we had known nothing at all about relativity, this 10-dimensional string theory would have revealed relativity theory in complete form. Therefore, the precise experimental confirmation of special and general relativity establishes to the same degree the creation of 10 space-time dimensions. Such profound, precise corroboration is both rare and wonderful in the world of science research. And here's why this is important. And from the Christian's perspective, its magnificence cannot be overstated. God's transcendence of 10 space-time dimensions and operation within those 10 dimensions explain certain mysteries of Christian theology, paradoxes that have puzzled Bible scholars for centuries. The very existence of such paradoxical doctrines in the Bible yields a powerful proof that the Bible must be divinely rather than humanly inspired. No one can visualize phenomena in more dimensions than what he or she is able to experience. For example, mathematicians can easily show that in four dimensions of space, a basketball can be turned inside out without making a cut 
or a hole in the skin of the basketball. However, because we are confined to just three space dimensions, we cannot gain a complete visual picture of the operation. This dimensional limitation in our capacity to visualize explains a key distinctive of the Bible among all holy books. Holy books, other than the Bible, contain only those doctrines that can be conceptualized within the dimensions of length, width, height, and time. Their lack of any content that would demand the operation of being transcendent to one four space-time dimensions raises a strong suspicion that their words were merely humanly inspired. The Bible alone contains doctrines, for example, the Trinity, the simulta simultaneity of human free choice and divine prede predetermination, mm -hmm. eternal security, the atonement, evil and suffering in the context of God's power and love, heaven and hell, that are impossible in our space-time dimensions, but are all resolvable given that a being powerful enough to create transcendently ten space-time dimensions exists. Such content in the Bible, and I was able to get this table in here, uh, establishes that its words must be inspired by the being that transcends ten space-time dimensions. Okay, do you see the importance of this? Yeah, okay, this is, a, again, something you've probably never thought about. But again, very important that adds to, you know, one of the reasons that I love apologetics isn't only to explain, because again, a lot of this stuff, I can't explain this stuff to somebody, okay? <laughs> I'm not worried about explaining to this to somebody, but I can tell somebody, you can read this. You can check it out for yourself. You can listen. You can watch you, Ross. Yeah. Yeah. In other words, there are certain things that are out of my zone of understandability, but I do understand what he's saying, and so do you. He's saying that only the Bible of all the so-called holy books get into a zone, get into an area that only makes sense if there's something that has given us this outside of our dimension. Okay? No other book does that. And so again, that is a powerful argument for the divinely inspired Word of God. Okay? Very, very powerful. All right? Uh, so again, it, uh, what we're trying to do in this class is build up our own faith based confidently on evidences so that you know, you're, when you go through suffering, when you go through trials, you're not questioning, is there a God? No, you're going, man, there's so many good reasons. There's so much evidence for this that I can go through this and I can believe those promises that await me. And, and that's why it's important to know what you believe and why you believe it as best as you can. Okay, so the Bible... Uh, in Table 1, Biblical Cosmology confirmed via trans and extra dimensionality. So he just gives seven here, but here's, a, here's some of the things that transcend this four-dimensional reality that all the other books talk about. So first, God existed before the universe. God exists totally apart from the universe and yet can be everywhere within it, according to Genesis 1 and Colossians 1. Secondly, time has a beginning. God's existence and cause and effect activities precede time. We see that in 2 Timothy 1 and Titus 1. Third, Jesus Christ created the universe. He has no beginning and he was not created, according to John 1.3 and Colossians 1.16 and 17. Number four, God created the universe from what cannot be detected with the five senses, according to Hebrews 11.3. Five, after his resurrection, Jesus could pass through walls in his physical body as evidence of his extra dimensionality. And we're going to have the same thing when we have glorified bodies, okay? According to Luke 24 and John 20. Number six, God is very near, yet we cannot see him, a further suggestion of his extra dimensionality. Exodus 33, Deuteronomy 30, John 6. And seven, God designed the universe in such a way that it would support human beings. Genesis 1, Nehemiah 9, John, Job 38, Psalm 8, Isaiah 45. Now let me get a drink real quick. Okay, creation radiation. In the 1940s, George Gamow, Ralph Alpher, 
and Robert Herman on the condition that the universe expands rapidly from a singularity, that is from a transcendent creation event, calculated that a faint background radiation from that event uh, just took a few degrees above absolute zero must exist everywhere in the sky astronomers look. The predicted radiation was discovered in 1964. In 1965, astronomers noted that for a star like the Sun and a planet like Earth to be possible so that physical life could survive, the radiation left over from the creation event must be very homogeneous on large scales and must match the energy spectrum of a perfectly radiating body. In the 1970s, several independent teams of astronomers observed that the cosmic background radiation indeed had these properties. Immediately following these discoveries in the 1970s, astronomers calculated <coughs> that for galaxies and stars to form out of a hot Big Bang creation event, tiny differences in the temperature of the cosmic background radiation must exist everywhere across the heavens at a level of slightly less than one part in a hundred thousand. In 1992, the COBE satellite and later several other instruments detected the temperature differences at exactly the level predicted by the creation model. It was this discovery that caused science historian Frederick Burnham to comment that the idea God created the universe had become more credible for scientists than in any other time in the past hundred years. Later, in 1993, COBE satellite measurements showed that the cosmic background radiation, the radiation remaining from the Genesis 1-1 creation event, fits the spectral profile of a perfect radiator to better than 0.03% precision over the entire range of wavelengths. This established that the universe is a half billion times more entropic that is, more efficient in radiating heat and light than a burning candle. Only one scientific explanation accounts for this extreme entropy measure. The universe must have started from a nearly infinitely hot and infinitely compact volume. This cosmic entropy measure eliminated any possibility for a reincarnating or oscillating universe. The Hindu, Buddhist, New Age idea of a universe cycling through a sequence of beginning, growth, contraction, and rebeginning. So that eliminates the possibility of Buddhism, Hinduism, and New Age ideas being true. Okay? It eliminates their, their total foundations. Okay? So tell that to your Marin neighbor <laughs> who believes that. Well. Yeah, but again, do it with love. And send them, give them a, bake them some cookies, you know. <laughs> Eliminated too is the, possi is the uh, possibility of stretching the bang of the creation event over a tightly spaced succession of little bangs. The universe must have erupted from a single explosive event that by itself accounts for at least 99.97% of the radiant energy in the universe. As far back as the 1940s, physicists noted that cosmic creation from a hot Big Bang implied that the background radiation would measure hotter and hotter as we look farther and farther away in the universe, hence farther and farther back in time. In 1994, using the newly built Keck telescope, astronomers determined that the cosmic background radiation affecting very distant gas clouds was hotter than the cosmic ra uh, background radiation we see today by exactly the amount predicted from a hot Big Bang creation event. The fifth prediction concerning the cosmic background radiation arising from the hot Big Bang creation event noted in 1992 was that the amplitude of the temperature differences in the hot cosmic background radiation would have different values at different angular resolutions. That is, a telescope only able to distinguish temperature details 10 moon diameters apart would see temperature differences a certain value smaller than a telescope capable of seeing temperature details one moon diameter apart, which in turn would see temperature differentiation a certain value larger than a telescope able to resolve details just a tenth of moon diameter apart. 
This prediction was proven true by several independent teams of observers in 99 and 2000. On April 25, 2000, the long-anticipated maps of the temperature differences in the cosmic background radiation from the boomerang observations were released at a NASA press conference and published in a subsequent issue of Nature. The maps made the front pages of newspapers and television news pro programs all over the world. The reason for all the excitement surrounding the boomerang results is that the measurements were made at so many different angular resolutions and with such precision that not only was the creation prediction proven correct, but the quality of the observations permitted for the first time an accurate determination of the geometry of the universe. Okay, now he gets into fine-tuning. And again, one of the things that uh, Hugh Ross has contributed to apologetics, to knowing what we believe and why we believe it, in the science realm, is he had a lot of his books are almost all talking about things that are so fine-tuned that the chances of, of life coming about by accident are essentially impossible. Okay, so he, he deals with all these scientific facts, um, again, a lot of which I don't understand, I don't comprehend, but if somebody's really into science, uh, he's a good guy to turn him on to because, again, what he's doing is he's showing through all these studies, like he's mentioning here, where all these scientists are discovering this, um, and, he's, and, and basically his conclude, their conclusion is we don't know enough yet. They're, they're not willing to say there's a God. They're not willing to say there's design. They'll say there's apparent design. Okay? They, they, the people are just so opposed and, and their conscience is so seared towards God that, again, but he's looking at all this stuff and he's going, this is just overwhelming evidence that there's a creator and that the God of the Bible is that creator. Okay, so page seven. What made the accurate measurement of the geometry of the universe theologically significant is that astronomers had already determined a relatively precise measure of the mass density of the universe. This mass density measure was for the total mass of the universe, including both ordinary matter and exotic matter. It was 28% of the density of the world have been necessary for matter. Okay, I'm going to skip through some of this. Let's go. <laughs> Right. <laughs> yeah. Actually, I'm going to go to page 11. So let's go to design. Again, you can read this on your own. Let's go to design parameters. Okay, as helpful as, as Big Bang cosmology has been in affirming both the Creator's existence and transcendence, it has provided what may be considered an even greater service in attesting the Creator's personal characteristics. The more we learn about the physics of the universe, the more clearly we see reflected not only awesome power, but also the mind and the heart of the one who planned and initiated and continues to sustain all things inanimate and animate. Big Bang cosmology is showing us both the universe's limits and its characteristics. More of both are coming with the measuring capacity of researchers, and as they do, the indications of exquisite design are becoming irrefutable. Astronomers and physicists, even the few who still hesitate to call themselves theists, widely acknowledge that the only reasonable explanation for the intricately harmonious features of the universe, our solar system, our planet, all ingeniously focused on the requirements for life is the action and ongoing involvement of a personal intelligent designer. Princeton University physicist Robert Dick in 1961 was the first to suggest that gravity required fine-tuning of life. Any conceivable kind of life were to be possible anywhere at any time in the universe. Carl Sagan calculated two more characteristics requiring fine-tuning namely the mass of the star and the distance of the planet from its star, which he published in 1963. In the first printing of The Fingerprint of God, that was Hugh Ross's first book that he wrote in 1989, I listed 16 characteristics of the universe and another 19 of the solar system that must be fine-tuned to make life possible and sustainable. 
By the time of the most recent printing of the second edition of The Creator and the Cosmos in 1995, by the way, now there's a fourth printing of that book, and there's more characteristics that have been discovered. But this was written back in 2001. Those lists had grown to 26 characteristics. I think now he's up to like 41 um, of the universe and 41 for the solar system. In the past few years, the pace of new discoveries demonstrating design in the universe and solar system has accelerated or escalated dramatically. I'm attempting to publish a quarterly update. The most recent of these updates described 35 characteristics for the universe and 122 for the solar system. So again, again it just, that's why these books keep having to be republished because there's more and more and more discoveries. And again, these all show uh, design and intelligence. A summary of the 35 characteristics of the universe that must be fine-tuned for any kind of physical life to be possible appears in Table 2 and Table 3. Again, I, I, w I wasn't able to get those in there, but those are already not obsolete, but the tables have gotten bigger, okay? There's more evidence. Let's skip down to the last sentence there. As cosmologist Ed Harrison says, an honest look at the cosmos's fine-tuned features leads to a moment of truth. Here is the cosmological proof of the existence of God, the design argument of Paley, updated and refurbished. So he's talking about William Paley. The fine-tuning of the universe provides prima facie evidence of deistic design. Take your choice, blind chance that requires multitudes of universes or design that requires only one. Blind chance that requires multitudes of universes or design that requires only one. Sorry, I read that twice. Many scientists, when they admit their views, incline towards the teleological or design argument. To place one's confidence in neo-Darwinist cosmology, that is blind chance, and the unknowable existence of a virtually infinitely number of universes, is to commit a form of the gambler's fallacy a logic error so blatant as to expose irrationality. Let me illustrate. One could argue that a single coin flipped 10,000 times, coming up heads all 10,000 times, is not evidence that the coin has been designed to favor heads over tails on flips. After all, there might be two to the 10,000 power of coins, two to the 10,000 different coin flippers producing two to the 10,000 outcomes different from the observed result of 10,000 consecutive heads. But if one had no evidence for the existence of two to the 10,000 coins, two to the 10,000 coin flippers, or two to the 10,000 distinct outcomes, then a form of the gambler's fallacy indeed will have committed because one would be assuming the benefit of an extremely large sample size when in fact the sample size is only one. Given one coin and one flipper and a finite number of flips, the rational interpretation is that someone has fixed either the coin or the toss to come up with heads 10,000 times in a row. In the case of the universe, we have one and only one to consider. General relativity tells us that since the first split second of the cosmos' existence, the space-time manifold of the universe has been thermodynamically closed. This description means the space-time envelope of our universe cannot possibly overlap the space-time envelope of any other hypothetical universes. Therefore, we can either place our bets on the only universe we can ever possibly know, or we can speculate about hypothetical universes that will forever remain outside our realm of knowledge. To bet that the universe fell, together exactly the way it is, precisely suited for life, by innumerable quirks of fate in innumerable universes makes even less sense than to bet that on the 10,000 first toss, that same coin that has come up heads on the previous 10,000 observed tosses will come up tails. So I think a, a pretty good analogy. So his conclusion, the community of believers has no reason to fear and every reason to anticipate the advance of scientific research into the origin and characteristics of the cosmos. The more we learn, the more evidence we accumulate for the existence of God and for his identity as the God revealed in the Bible. 
Those who fight hardest against a supernatural or theistic explanation for the cosmos often produce the most powerful new evidence for it. <laughs> As technology produces new measuring tools and theoretical capacities increase, the clearer the case for Christ, the Creator will grow. Though not many scholars who write about these new measurements acknowledge Jesus as Lord and Savior, they do admit that the best, perhaps the only, explanation for the universe we observe is the work of an entity beyond the space-time continuum of the universe capable of exquisite design and of carrying out that design. Whether they know it or not, in their admission they have testified eloquently of the God who made us and wants us and wants to be known by us. Cool. Yeah. So again, take uh, take extra copies to give to your science friends. Um, and um, again, any any comments or I probably can't answer any of your questions. But if any of you have <laughs> comments, yeah. I'm going to be facetious and say that next time you present something like that, tell me to drink two cups of coffee <laughs> per day or more of 50%. Yeah. It's way over my head. Yeah. And I'll say it out loud. I don't yeah. want to even think that I totally get it. But yeah. I did underline a lot, and I'm yeah. glad that you took the time to emphasize yeah. the more simpler <laughs> concepts. Yeah. I just feel like I have to say it out loud. Yeah. I didn't like math either, by the way. Yeah. <laughs> okay. <laughs> Yeah, thanks. In the past, the uh, recent past, the theory was that um, there was a big bang and then things expanded and then they contracted another big bang and they expanded mm -hmm. and contracted and each time it got more complex and that kind of uh, somehow mi took the design out of it. Mm -hmm. <laughs> um, how, how is, I mean, this seems obviously refutes that. Right. Um, what, I, I don't understand. I guess I'm trying to understand how they came to this conclusion that expanding and contracting and blowing up multiple times yeah. somehow <laughs> yeah. somehow took the design out of it. I don't get that. Yeah, I don't either. I, 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 again, I, I, yeah, I think that, again, that's, that's why it's interesting to read people that do where you need extra cups of coffee and, <laughs> and need to make sure you're pretty awake. Uh, you know, again, I just appreciate the fact that Again, I know, I know Hugh Ross. I've, I've met him a few times. As a matter of fact, um, the guy who leads his organization in India has invited me to, to India to do an apologetics conference um, it, next year. So, um, so I'll be partnering with Hugh Ross's organization, Reason to Believe, in India, most, you know, God willing, next year sometime. Um, but I've met Hugh Ross several times, and again, he's a very humble guy. Um, unfortunately, people like Ken Ham, like I agree with Ken Ham, I'm a young earth guy, so I agree more with Ken Ham than I do with Hugh Ross. But I, I, think, it's, I, I think it's unfortunate. Th this happened in the 70s too with the tribulation. I just want to give a, an analogy of this. So I, I hold to a rapture. And I believe there's going to be a rapture before the tribulation. Um, so I believe that there's two aspects of the second coming of Christ. So the Bible talks about the second coming, and I believe the Bible talks about the rapture too. It doesn't use that word in the, in the Greek. It uses it in the Latin, and that's where we get the idea of the rapture from 1 Thessalonians 4. But again, why do I believe in the rapture? Well, there's a, there's a bunch of reasons, but one of the main reasons I believe in the rapture is I believe there's at least 10 passages that distinguish between, if you look at, if you write the passages side by side, you'll see that there's differences in the two passages. So for instance, there is a talk of Jesus coming to meet the saints in the air, and then there's another passage that talks about him coming with the saints and landing on the ground. Well, to me, those are two, th those are conflicting. So I can't, I, I can't say that's the same event. I have to say those are two different events. 
And the reason I do that is because, again, there's at least 10 passages, but then on top of, the, of those 10 passages, then there's how does this all fit into God's promises to Israel, God's land promises from the Old Testament, are these to be taken symbolic or literal, and then you take the whole of eschatology and you're trying to understand, all right, is there one second coming or are there two phases of the second coming? So I'm convinced of the fact that there's a rapture coming before the tribulation, and then we come with Jesus at the end of the tribulation. That's what we call the second coming, and then we have the ushering in of a millennial kingdom. Now, there are Christians that totally disagree with me, that think I'm nuts, that think anybody who believes in the rapture is a wacko, and there are Christians like that. I know them, and I've talked to them. And um, and, and back in the 70s, it used to be almost like if you were, were pre-tribulational, if you held to a rapture before the second coming, that there were two distinct events, uh, it was almost like they thought I was, uh, maybe I'm not even a Christian, okay? And these guys, guys like me, thought maybe these guys aren't Christians. Now, I think there are people like that in this issue where there are young earth people that think Hugh Ross isn't even saved. And he's an emissary of Satan because he holds to this old earth view. Now, I think that's, I just, I, I, I honestly just have to say, I think that's foolish thinking. I just do. And I think it's foolish of somebody who holds to a second, my best friend holds to a post-tribulation rapture. We're best friends. But he thinks I'm wrong and I think he's wrong. Um, and, but we still love each other and we would get along just fine. But I always tell him, you know, you're, well, you're going you're gonna to change your view when I meet you up in the air if neither of us die before that. And then he tells me, well, you're going to change your tune when the Antichrist is announced and you're going to be forced to take the mark of the beast. And so, yeah, I will change my view at that point. <laughs> but the reality is, I think it's, I don't think there's enough evidence in Scripture for the age of the earth or for the rapture and the second coming distinctions, I, I can't say with 100% certainty that I'm right. And I don't think somebody who doesn't hold, who doesn't hold to a, a, a twofold coming of, you know, if somebody is post-tribulational, there are people like John Piper, my best friend, Dave Steele, um, R.C. Sproul, people that, that I love, although R.C. Sproul knows the truth now because he's with the Lord. But, <laughs> No, but honestly, I mean, seriously, I think these are issues where we need to make our best. You know, we, we need to try to defend these things biblically and dialogue about these things. But I, I think it's better to say, I'm not absolutely 100% sure on this thing. Mm -hmm. But here's what I am sure of. And ultimately, whether it's Hugh Ross leading somebody to Christ or Ken Ham leading somebody to Christ, I'm glad that both those guys are being used by God's kingdom, even though obviously they both can't be right on this area. But aren't you glad that our salvation doesn't depend on us being right about everything? <laughs> you know? Or understanding everything. Yeah, or understanding everything. So, so I think we have to be, I, I think studying theology and studying and talking about truth and what's right and what's wrong should lend itself, it should lend itself to humility. Because I, I, think, I, I think if any, if I talk to anybody who thinks like I'm right on every area of, of reality, that person is foolish, I think. Okay, I don't even, I, I don't think I'm right on everything. As a matter of fact, it, it's terrifying to me to think that I could be wrong. You know, I know I'm wrong in certain areas. If I knew where they were, I'd change my view. But this is an area where I'm not willing to say, this is exact, K.P. Colson is 100% correct. I'm going to die on this hill. No, I can't say that. Yeah. Yeah, you know, you got to remember, it's, it's all about God. It's not about us yeah. or our capability or our understanding. Yeah. It's how we're just trying to get a better appreciation of just how yeah. amazing and wise and intelligent and powerful God is. Yeah. We just, we just get little bits and pieces where we can. Yeah. And that's what I like, at, at least with, like with Hugh, like with intelligent, with the intelligent design movement, they're just trying to say this science points to intelligence, science points to design. Hugh Ross is at least saying 
not only does it point to intelligence and design, it points specifically to the God of the Bible. So he's going a step beyond the intel, and I appreciate that. And again, that isn't the, the, the point of the intelligent design movement. I think the point of the intelligent design movement is they're trying to say, let's have an alternative to evolution. Since evolution is such a poor theory, let's at least have an alternative in our public square. Mm. And they're even canceled because of that. You know, not even saying, but <coughs> the people on the opposite side, they're smuggling God in. You know, that's what they say. We have to cancel them because they have an alternative motive. They're trying to smuggle God into the public square. And they're not. They're just saying, hey, let's at least acknowledge there's design here. Let's at least acknowledge there's an intelligence behind this.